This video and others like it are made possible by the generous support of my patrons on Patreon. If you'd like to help support my channel, join our Discord server, and get early access to every video, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash second thought. How's it going? Me? I was very sick the last couple weeks, which is why the EU border video was a week late. Thank goodness you all subscribed, or you might have forgotten about my channel. You are subscribed, right? But enough about hitting subscribe, smashing the bell, and reducing the like button to a fine powder. A couple weeks ago, Mark Robert released this video. Pranks destroy scam callers, glitter bomb payback. If you can look past it being titled like a bootleg Amazon product, Mark's video is actually really interesting. And assuming you have no idea what I'm talking about, basically in this video, Mark set out to prank three big scam call centers in Kolkata, India, with the help of two other YouTube channels. These scam call centers pretend to be legitimate businesses like Amazon or Microsoft customer support, and then scam mostly elderly people out of large sums of money. As payback, Rober gets people to go incognito into the offices of these fraudulent call centers and prank them in a couple different ways. Dyeing their hand soap blue, making it smell real bad in there, and releasing cockroaches in the open space on top of the classic and cleverly foreshadowed in the title, spraying a bunch of glitter all over the place. The point is to raise awareness about this kind of scam. And it's a fine video, genuinely. One of the call centers Mark features in the video actually got shut down thanks to all the attention it got, which is really good. And yet after watching that video, I was left with a bit of a weird taste in my mouth. I don't brush my teeth and I sure as hell won't start now, but that's not why. I couldn't tell why watching this video felt a little… good. After all, Mark is doing some pretty gross stuff almost exclusively targeting low-level workers on the other side of the world that you probably didn't even know existed less than a week ago. And it's not like it's their idea to scam people, nor are they the ones profiting and getting massively wealthy from it. Like anyone else, they need a job, and it just so happens that the one they do is really gross. If we went after everyone whose job made the world a worse place, most people would be in trouble. In Rober's video, the people who own these companies get out mostly unscathed. One center got shut down, sure, but it's not like there aren't hundreds more and new ones can't crop up with very little effort. So with all that in mind, why does it still feel good watching people get pranked like this? It's not just that the pranks are mostly harmless and that most people like a fun prank. It's something else, something more visceral. Reading through the comments, I saw a lot of other people who really liked the video and who actually wished the pranks were more vengeful. That got me wondering, why? Why do these commenters like this video so much they're hoping to get involved in making it more aggressive? Why does this video exist and who is it for? The thing is that right at the start, Mark tells us who he's making the video for. This video is for Bessie, an elderly woman who gets scammed out of $20,000 by one of these fake support call centers pretending to be Amazon. Oh no, this is a mistake. Oh, I screwed up. Oh, I Jesus. I'm, it was supposed to be a, a oh, 200 Christ. in there. Oh, oh God Almighty! I'm exhausted. I can't do this. My mind is My absolutely DJ fried. Mark feels really bad for her, and you can't blame him. It's a heartbreaking story, and as you're watching his video, it's impossible not to imagine this kind of scam happening to one of your older loved ones, or maybe even yourself in the not too distant future. But I think there's more to it than what Mark says out loud. While watching, it's also impossible not to think about your own experiences with call centers, both scam and regular. The video inevitably triggers some of the worst memories you've had with a health insurance or internet provider or something like that. You know the kind of thing I'm talking about. You'll almost certainly have spent countless hours with representatives from this or that company disputing some ridiculous charge or getting a small problem fixed and being met with insane wait times, complicated procedures, and needing to provide numbers or documentation from an email in an inbox you don't even use anymore. Seeing these elderly people deal with these already exhausting calls, made even worse by the massive amounts of money being stolen, can't help but bring back personal memories. These bureaucratic, technical calls affect all of us at some point. They affect me. Now that I exclusively text, basically every phone call I make starts with me saying my full name, date of birth, and the last four digits of my social. I get my identity stolen a lot. Regardless, for just about every product you own and every service you pay for, whenever you need to do something just a step above basic use, or whenever you encounter the slightest problem, you can safely assume you'll be confronted with bureaucracy, an excessively complicated administrative procedure, a bunch of red tape, and technical BS you have no control over. When you read those comments under Mark's video, it's easy to see how that plays into the video's success. 
His video isn't just for Bessie. Mark put it on YouTube, so it's mostly for us. Rober's video perfectly scratches an itch we all have. Bureaucracy sucks. Mark's attack on these call centers works as a viral video, not only because we empathize with vulnerable people getting tricked by an awful grift, but because it resonates with an experience we all have. We all hate that person on the other end of the line following a dialogue tree and telling us there's nothing they can do except screw us over. Mark's video works because we feel like we're getting a small, mostly harmless bit of revenge. It doesn't matter to us that these are low-level employees who aren't really in control. It's about the principle. We didn't ask for this either. And that's where this whole thing really started for me. I want to figure out why. Why do we feel this way? Why does everyone you know have a bad experience with bureaucracy? I thought bureaucracy was supposed to be over in our advanced neoliberal capitalist society. At least, that's what I've always been told. Wherever government bureaucracy takes over, costs go up and quality goes down. That's no less true of the post office than it is of the schooling system. It's no less true of garbage collection than it is of the schooling system. That lint-covered lollipop giving a speech is Milton Friedman. You might have heard that name before because for over 50 years, he's been the guy when it comes to hating bureaucracy. And it just so happens that he's also the guy that has shaped our modern economy probably more than anyone else specifically by attacking bureaucracy, which he believed the government had created a safe space for. This guy hated bureaucracy like I hate coming up with an analogy. Just listen to him explain it in an article with a title that pretty much gives you his whole vibe. Why government is the problem. Government has become a self-generating monstrosity. Abraham Lincoln talked about a government of the people, by the people, for the people. What we have now is a government of the people, by the bureaucrats, including the legislators who have become bureaucrats, for the bureaucrats. You get the idea. Governments are bad because of bureaucracy, therefore get rid of governments as much as possible and you'll get rid of bureaucracy and in the process solve all sorts of problems. This matters because even though he died over a decade ago, Milton Friedman is the cultural mainstay for those who promote so-called free market policies and who constantly call for smaller governments staffed with fewer bureaucrats. The kind of people who believe that the state's responsibility is to completely abandon social projects and instead devote all its energy to making sure markets are profitable. Milton influenced guys like the Libertarian Party presidential candidate Gary Johnson, who you might remember from clips like these. Governors, uh, could you name three federal departments or agencies that you would eliminate? Uh, education, uh, the Department of Commerce, and Housing and Urban Development. How's that for starters? <laughs> and would, would any of their functions still be performed by the federal government? Gosh, uh, if, and uh, you'd have to assume that they were doing something that was of value, and yeah, if they are doing something of value, um, yes, we would, uh, we would be looking to uh, continue those operations. Those departments all do a <laughs> lot of stuff. You can't identify any specific things well, no, they you, do? Well, no, but you're, you're, ask, you're asking three departments, and I, I'm giving them to you. Right, but and, then you're... Uh, well, but let's then just take the assumption right, that but, they should be eliminated. Right, but with all due respect... And as dumb as Gary looks here, that same philosophy he inherited from Milton Friedman is everywhere on the right. Rush Limbaugh tells his listeners that Milton Friedman should be the Bible for young people, or anybody trying to understand capitalism and free markets. Charlie Kirk, founder of Turning Point USA, celebrates Hayek and Friedman in his book while Ben Shapiro holds up Friedman as a conservative icon in National Review. People on the right, and more generally, all the politicians that advocate for a more expansive capitalism, smaller governments, and all sorts of free market policies, owe their support for this economic model to the guy who made it extremely popular. How'd it get so popular? Well, Milton got big because constantly talking about how much you hate bureaucracy always works. Everyone hates bureaucrats but it worked especially well in America a half century ago. That's because right next to the US, there was a country that Americans really didn't like, and that had a lot of bureaucracy. No, not that one. No, not that one either, silly. I bet you forgot about Alaska, didn't you? No, the country Americans hated touching tips with was the Soviet Union. In the American mind, it was the epitome of what a bureaucratic government could get you. 
and it was bad, so it was pretty easy for old Millie Freeds and all his buddies to dunk on the American government by likening it to the Soviets. Americans really hated the Soviet Union, so anything that made their government seem anything like it was a super effective way to promote capitalist economics. And at the core of this discourse was the promise that capitalism would solve the problem of bureaucracy, and in the process, most everything else. This video's number two Mark, Mark Fisher, talks about this very kind of logic in his book Capitalist Realism. Except he uses fancy academic words to say the same thing I said, but better, so now you're gonna get a quote. In making their case against socialism, neoliberal ideologues often excoriated the top-down bureaucracy which supposedly led to institutional sclerosis and inefficiency in command economies. With the triumph of neoliberalism, bureaucracy was supposed to have been made obsolete, a relic of an unlamented Stalinist past. Yet this is at odds with the experiences of most people working and living in late capitalism, for whom bureaucracy remains very much a part of everyday life. Instead of disappearing, bureaucracy has changed its form, and this new, decentralized form has allowed it to proliferate. Look around you. Look at where we are. We're in Milton's world. It's like Disney World, except… well, actually it's a lot like Disney World. If you're an adult and you're really into it, maybe it's time to sit down and think about that for a while. Milton was an advisor to Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, who are most responsible for implementing the neoliberal capitalism we live in today. He was lead architect of our modern society, but surprise surprise, bureaucracy is a bigger part of our lives today than it ever was. Here's Fisher again talking about this, how frustrating it is, and in the process actually ending up explaining why Mark Rober's video works. As a consumer in late capitalism, you increasingly exist in two distinct realities. The one in which the services are provided without hitch, and another reality entirely. The crazed Kafka-esque labyrinth of call centers. Anger can only be a matter of venting. It is aggression in a vacuum, directed at someone who is a fellow victim of the system, but with whom there is no possibility of communality. Just as the anger has no proper object, it will have no effect. In this experience of a system that is unresponsive, impersonal, centerless, abstract, and fragmentary, you are as close as you can be to confronting the artificial stupidity of capital in itself. Capitalists will constantly tell us we live in this seamless, efficient, optimized reality, but love to ignore the horrible bureaucracy it all rests on that fundamentally contradicts it. You can think of all this bureaucracy like an iceberg. At the top, you have the bureaucracy that is immediately visible to all of us. Things like call centers, of which scam callers are nothing more than an offshoot. But below, there's so much more. The logic of bureaucracy permeates capitalism to its very core. Embedded in the logic of capitalism, there are a few things that make bureaucracy not only inevitable, but more likely to proliferate. The first is the hierarchy of private organizations. Bureaucracy arises when people carry out decisions they do not make themselves. That classic line, there's nothing I can do, you get when dealing with any kind of bureaucrat. Workers are not decision makers in capitalist society. So it's no surprise when someone on the phone just follows a set of steps they have no say in and can't adapt to your specific situation beyond what they're given on their dialogue sheet. The second way bureaucracy is built in is through the constant drive for profit maximization requiring ever more technical and precise systems of measurement, even in places where measuring things makes very little sense. In other words, once again the fancy Mark Fisher ones, aims and objectives, outcomes, mission statements have proliferated even as neoliberal rhetoric about the end of top-down centralized control has gained preeminence. Basically, they tell us one thing and another thing happens. That's super vague, so here's a concrete example. That Milton Friedman clip from earlier came from a talk where he spends over an hour on how government bureaucracy is ruining education in the US. So now that his ideas have become how the world works, let's see how much less bureaucratic education has become. In the realm of education, professors and teachers are constantly being asked to fill paperwork specifying what they're going to teach and how, what they will assess students on and how, the metrics of student satisfaction, their own self-assessment, how they assess their peers, how their supervisors assess them, what standardized test results they produce so they can be compared to other teachers at their school, and how those same tests can be used so their school can be compared to other schools. Bureaucracy has taken over educators' jobs. Not because Milton failed in promoting his vision of government, but specifically because free market reforms have been so successful. Bureaucracy took root specifically because under neoliberal regimes, governments and all their subsidiary institutions, like schools, are guided to act like private businesses. And private businesses are obsessed with measuring, down to the very last detail. 
even when it makes almost no sense, in order to compete against one another. Ergo, bureaucracy, paperwork, very unsmooth, unseamless interactions. I bet you're looking for another Mark Fisher quote saying what I say, but better. The idealized market was supposed to deliver friction-free exchanges, in which the desires of consumers would be met directly, without the need for intervention or mediation by regulatory agencies. Yet the drive to assess the performance of workers and to measure forms of labor which, by their nature, are resistant to quantification, has inevitably required additional layers of management and bureaucracy. Milton Friedman was wrong about bureaucracy disappearing under neoliberalism. He got it exactly backwards. Bureaucracy only got stronger and more developed, less associated with the state and more prevalent in our everyday lives. That's because neoliberal capitalism was never actually about freeing markets from bureaucratic governments. It was always about subordinating the state to the market, imposing the market's own bureaucracy on the rest of society, and this time with fewer checks on power. Governments have become mere administrators of an economy they purposely put outside their reach. Ironically, yet unsurprisingly, Milton's crusade against bureaucrats created a government that's even more bureaucratic and less accountable. Mark Rober's Scam Call Revenge video is the perfect example of what this society Milton built has pushed us to. We are so infuriatingly surrounded by bureaucracy that we vent and take out our anger on people who have virtually no control over what's happening to us, and who are disempowered by design. Heck, a lot of the time, being yelled at is the whole point of their job in the first place. To be human lightning rods for an economy we don't have a say in, but we are constantly told is the best there is. Without an economy that can actually hold people accountable when they do something messed up, specifically because it's profitable, all we are left with are videos that let us release our anger and make an important but still very modest difference. Mark Rober's video is interesting not only because it leads to something good happening, albeit with some unpleasantness for our fellow workers, but it also shows us how ultimately that's not enough. We need to, and can, change the system that will always, inevitably produce this bureaucracy. As I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, content like this is made possible by my patrons on Patreon. It's really hard not to get demonetized when you make socialist videos, so I have to depend pretty heavily on viewers like you. If you appreciate the work I'm doing, and you're able to chip in even a dollar a month, I would greatly appreciate the support. As a little show of that appreciation, every patron, regardless of pledge amount, gets early access to every video, plus access to our patrons-only Discord server. It's a really fun place to hang out, join a book club, and meet some like-minded people. So if you'd like to help keep Second Thought afloat, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash secondthought. It really does help support me and my channel. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.